district. I will call the meeting of the Driftwood Elementary School Committee to order at 502 p.m. The meeting is being recorded. Um, the first order of business tonight is um, a couple of appointments. Um, appointing secretary first. Um, Anne has offered to take on the role, so thank you. Appoint Ann Curtis as well as secretary. And we also need a CES representative, and we do have to vote for choose one tonight for the meeting. Anyone interested? <laughs> I didn't anticipate a fight over it. <laughs> no. I can do it. I think that evening availability is like a little bit shoddy at the moment. Not a, so I'm not, depends on, yeah, so much more people look at that regularly. I can do it. Okay, so I point. Myself, uh, CES rep. All right, now we're looking so at the minutes from June 6, 2003. There's still two. Second. There's no comment. All in favor? Yes. Here we go. Shelly, financial statements. Hi, good to see you all again. Oh, I should have started off with the welcome back. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and now we're jumping into the next. Welcome, Trevor. Thank you. All right, so 61 warrants were signed in uh, late June, July, and August, and then the early part of September. That's a significant amount, but as a reminder, it pays some of 23 warrants as we close out the year and then started fiscal year 24. So the total warrants signed were $487,672.03. I sent you out the uh, general fund and school choice expense reports. I'm happy to take questions on them, although it is early in the year to even sort of dive into some of the overages or savings on accounts because we're still trying to work out all the camps with salary and wage placement. Um, but I will note uh, teacher salaries are going to be over budget because of various personnel changes that took place since the budget was approved. I think we're gonna have money to cover that uh, because at a minimum, the nurse leader position is no longer full-time. That's a stipend position. So that's a significant reduction there. So there's not gonna be an issue with the budget. Um, I also expect that the budget's gonna be much tighter this year than it has in prior years because Deerfield has traditionally for at least the last three years had two to three, I think last year they had four people on leave of absence, four teachers. This year we only have one and we have replaced that position. So there is a substitute in that role. So we won't have the savings that we typically have in the salaries and wage lines. So things are gonna be a little bit tighter. Uh, the other line that I wanted to comment on already and this seems to come up the last few years over and over again is that our maintenance budget is almost 50% spent already and it's only September 14th. Um, 9,000 of, actually, I think we've spent around 11,000, uh, and about nine of that was to repair the air handler units. So not mini splits, not the heat pumps, but the actual large units that are in the administrative offices, those needed significant repairs over the summer. The heat and AC was not working there original to the building, as far as I understand. So, you know. 30 year old systems and we just had to spend the money there. And then there's been some other miscellaneous things here and there, nothing else extraordinary. Um, the walk-in did have another significant repair. If you remember, we talked about the walk-in last fall as well, that maybe that's something we need to eventually get on a capital list. Uh, there was several free on leaks and that had to be taken care of, but we paid for it from school and revolving. So it didn't affect budget, but it was about a $5,000 expense. So. Again, just something to note. Uh, otherwise, I don't have anything further unless you have specific questions. Uh, Trevor, I can send you the report. That'd be great. So do that. And Gee, then was the walk in, uh, I thought that was on to be replaced, or is it an old frontier we were looking at? So, frontier is being replaced. Yep. We talked about it here last year, and we're told that 
the walk-in itself is good, but the refrigeration unit just might need whatever's on the top of it, I think, might need to be. Yeah, okay. exactly. All right. Um, so we'll, we have a capital meeting on the 20th with Bill, and these will be the kind of things that we're talking about of, no, you know, yeah. what were our emergency unforeseen repairs and right. do we need to put something on the list as a major problem? Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. And it, and it could just be that it's still early and we don't know, but I know that we have talked about how the early childhood um, sort of budget is sort of continues to track to be off. And I was just looking at what's listed here. Yeah. So revenue is significantly higher than we expected. So okay. that's promising news. Okay. Um, we did overspend last year. So last year, I think we started the year with about 65 or 70,000 and this year we're only starting with 50. So we did use up some of our reserves. The good news is that the projected revenue should cover the projected expenses as they stand right now. And it's anticipated that we'll have almost the same amount, about 50,000 left at the end of the year. So as long as we continue on that track, we'll be in good shape. Um, I think Kim, um, who's in the director position for early childhood is doing a good job of accommodating families and fitting schedules in. And um, there were some changes, right, with after school, I think. Well, they know Friday, it's, there's an option to stay until three. There's, yeah, so I know that there's also a potential, and I don't know how that factors in that people can stay till three or 5.30. Some of it and goes they, to aftercare if they stay till 5.30 and not okay. the early childhood. But that looks like it's better news. Than yes, it's much better news. And it can still fluctuate as the year goes on if someone goes to leave and you can go up if you have to take yeah. in on the student who isn't just full. Yep. How much, um, how much capacity do you have? In, uh, in, they have two full classrooms. They do? Which, mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, okay. they're both full. I don't have the exact numbers in front of me. I don't know. Well, I don't know. The needs of the classroom as well. Uh, so. The other comment I'll make about the revolving fund. So the school choice balance, you can see there for the projected expenses for this year. First of all, I'll say revenue is down. We brought in about three hundred and forty thousand last year. Tina and I have looked at the end of year list. We have, um, I want to say, nine outgoing sixth graders that are no longer here, they moved down to seventh grade, and we only took in three new choice students. So we're gonna be down revenue, but this is conversation that we had last year. This was part of the decision of consolidating classrooms. We knew that there was gonna be a potential impact and, and that is coming to fruition. So while the school choice balance right now is really healthy, we're going to have to pay attention to that in the future. But what I will say about the expenses at 377,000, which is more than our revenue, it includes currently 52,000 for the air conditioning project that we're gonna see about 45,000 back in rebates. So that expense will actually come down. I've just accounted for it. It's 52 total, it's about 45. Yeah, we won't get dollar for dollar back, but we'll get close. I think uh, we were able to do 11 rooms mm -hmm. between what the town covered on warrant, what we're covering through this, and then the rebate, I think in the end, we'll end up only paying for three of the 11 the town paid for a good chunk of it but the school yeah. will end up paying yeah. for three of them that's great that's solid. Mm -hmm. yeah. um i think that's all i have unless you have something to talk about school lunch i know darius is going to talk about this or at least it's in a superintendent report in case anyone doesn't know it's universally free not just for this year but that's permanent in the law now so mm -hmm. they would have to pass to change the law in the future uh, so again we have healthy balances there if things stay on as projected, we will bring in enough to cover expenses. And we're looking at, you know, what other types of things can we work on improving um, food quality wise, food service wise, district wide, having those conversations and um, equipment repairs. We've done quite a bit in this building in the last few years between grants and um, town funds, but there's always more we can do because a lot of the equipment in there is for the so. I feel like right now we're in good shape. <laughs> we'll see what happens come budget building season, but <laughs> right now we're looking good. <laughs> yep. All right. Um, principal's report. Um, 
Tina's out here. She's gonna email. So yeah, she probably started off with that. Tina had a uh, last minute where she had a follow up with a personal issue. So um, she said she was gonna send the report to you folks. If you didn't get it yet, we'll be getting it. Probably all the screens going on. a couple of comments. There's uh, no one in the room. Is, is there anyone online who wanted to comment? Or like and get to know. Okay, moving on to unfinished business. Capital update. Yeah, so the capital update I will um run you through this the, the summer of pictures here. Right. So our summer project, you know, I put them all in one just so you can see how busy we're doing. So I'll fly through the ones that aren't ours, but just so you have an idea of all the things that are happening in the district. Frontier got new boilers installed. New tennis courts, they should be done by next Saturday. Uh, they painted the bottom part of the gym. Thank you. Um, that's what the boys' locker room looks like. It's good now. I mean, it looks good in this picture. It does not look good now. But we redid the floor. Um, the construction of this was actually finished this week. I could have ran out and took a picture of it, but they put a new top on the looks really nice on the top of that. The floor was giving out the, the thing I'd been leaking for years. Yeah. Then here we are, do you feel formatting well? Oops. Right. So we as you saw, we moved all the bushes. The town helped us out with that. They pulled the bushes out, and then we contracted with Snows to do plantings and move the grass up to the building, um, which is nice. Um, here is a action from a preschool room, but in the back you can see the installed the uh, what do you call it? mini splits. We have a new dishwasher, which we didn't get a picture of, <laughs> but it does not load itself. Nor does mine at home. I keep telling my kids that. We uh, uh, just refinished the floor. That wasn't completely redone; just refinished. That looked nice. Got a new shed up Seven. front. Very nice, very pretty. And then in Sunderland, I'll go through the other details when I pull up in a minute of the smaller stuff we did in the building here, but they put AC in just their library. They had some floor entry problems where we had to redo the floor entrances. They're in the middle of a bid for an old tank replacement, which is a big project for them. They had their phone system replaced. They, they painted the whole interior of their school. It's fabulous. Wheatley put new bathroom floors in from the old tile floors. While the old tile probably was more expensive to put in originally, it's very hard to clean. They put in new sidewalks where they got a grant, say Roots to Schools grant. Their tree got struck by lightning during the summer and we'll be paying $8,000 to remove them, but we're working in a town to bring that number down. They painted their library, got new tables for the cafeteria and painted their cafeteria. Conway put a new generator in. With all the problems they're having up in Conway, it's probably a good idea. Yeah. Um, they AC two more rooms. They have two rooms left until their building is completely AC. They got a new range for the kitchen, which has been an absolute nightmare for us because there's a lot of problems with it. They got a new stage curtain, which they went to the town for funding on. They got new flooring. Um, much like we've been doing in this building, they've been rotating and doing the same idea. Um, they finally got the office done with carpet and you can see the floor right here. And they got a, a pest free storage container. We also got one at Frontier just to do some additional storage needs. It's not a pretty picture, but it's a lot better looking with these new partitions. And as you can see, we're probably going to be dealing with their, those floors in the near future because those are tougher and tougher to clean. And that is it in pictures. So stop sharing there. And then um, some of the smaller stuff at Deerfield um, was that we did have to pay. I don't remember if we talked about this in June, but for the um, AC units, we did have to run new electricity lines through, um, which was in a, which was around. And uh, you don't know, or you give me a look. Am I going up or down? Fifteen, twenty. It was almost forty thousand for the electrical. For, the AC, for both for the wings, AC. for both it was each okay. So for each wing, so so forty thousand just to run the AC, um, because the electric panel in this building is not 
It's never it was not built to hold that. So we had to put in sub panels um, in the wings in order to run the AC. And what they did will have capacity to do the rest of the buildings. Okay. So. You that from uh, we had um, budget savings from the salary so. position that was not held. Right. Yeah. So the big investment. Yeah. So it was either. Right. So we see we put AC. We could have used the just the AC warrant and not put an AC just in the electrical right. part to prep right. it. But like we said, we had any year his savings and we did about it. Right. Um, and then we did the wood chips. Oh, the playground up front. That's a, it's a five thousand dollar thing. The reason I'm saying it, it's five thousand dollars annually because we're going to be talking about um, improving that area in our conversation later tonight. I believe that is all we had for besides the wonderful cleaning and prepping. And I think they had some murals done in the building. I haven't been in the building, but I think they had some of the walls. Thanks, how it tells you which hallway you're going down. If you're in the three, four hallway, I go one, two hallway. I've it's had this nice. Is it good? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is the capital update. And obviously, we're going to start putting together the capital plan for next year. So we'll be doing that over the next two months and um, we bring it to you for updates as Out it's front ready. Painting two. Oh, right. oh, yeah, the painting on the when you're coming into the building that says you are loved and the grade levels that were painted? Yes. Yes. A lot of updates here in Resolution. Yeah, it's very busy, a lot of them. And some of them are multi when you're bidding and doing all that and doing you know, your small ones and very large it's ones. Good to see. You do them Thank you. But it's also good to see the Across the district that we're getting yeah i mean all the committees are working hard to get these things kind of through to find the money get the warrants passed uh, and so forth and next year is going to be busy for us too as we'll get into some of those projects to you there you go let's jump straight in <laughs> so um very excitingly we did get the um mvp grant to improve the front walkway of the building right we talked about that um, and so we are now at the point where um, I had a meeting with, um, uh, I want to do a special thank you to Chris Curtis who put together the grant and he's kind of been helping me get this situated and working with the engineering company because we have the funding source of the $85,000 for the warrant. And then we have a funding source that's coming from this grant. Um, and the grant itself is looking, is to going to pay um, in total, 152,000 um, to work on the green, the gardens and such in the drainage. So now we're at the point where um, we had a couple of meetings in the last two weeks and um, I need to get a pricing on what it's going to cost to put the either asphalt or concrete in the front. Um, we did a general, how much would it cost on the cheap? Um, $85,000, if you want to start doing stamped concrete, is going to probably be much more than that. And so probably closer to one fifty. So I'm going high there on the estimate, but we're trying to get those estimates both in concrete and in asphalt. Um, and the difference, and we can, we'll talk about the difference between the two when I have a little bit more than just the basics, but you know, concrete is um, well, the stronger setup, although if you put salt on it, you're gonna have issues there. Um, also, they're about the same in price for material, except the concrete needs rebar and metals through the roof. So that's what we'll, we'll kind of do a thing. But we want to do some sort of design that's in the original plans for that. Um, and that wasn't part of the MVP um, grant request. So, um, you know, there is rain gardens and um, water mitigation strategies and and such there. So we're trying now. We have to take the two projects and put them together, and as we're in the process of doing, um, and really try to get it out to bid for next summer. It's kind of where we're at there. Um, so I will probably back be back because I don't think eighty five thousand dollars is going to cover what we want to do, and we're probably going to have to make some decisions on what the design we, how much where we're going to go with the design. 
Um, the design right now, if you think back, had a, um, I put it up, it'll probably take me five minutes to figure out how to get it up. It had kind of like a, a sunshine, like a ray of light coming from the door, um, a pathways of stamped concrete. You know, if we have to reduce that back, you know, I want to do something nice in, in that kind of thing. We also have to look at the original design that the architects created uh, within the MVP grant, just had the front, not the walkway all the way, whack, <laughs> all the way where Either we just side. put in the new plantings and such. Right. So, so we want to be able to do that whole walkway and that might increase it. So maybe we just do plain asphalt up too, and then we do a design as we come in. So that's what we're gonna have to work with the engineers on as soon as um, I have to come up with a general hard pack number because that was not part of the original engineer. So. And yes, and according to the, with the grant, um, I pledge that we would spend $30,000 to match. Because if you don't do a matching, they probably won't get it. So, of that, thank you, Shelly. Probably should jump in sooner. You know, of that 152, 30,000 is coming from us. So we only got one, you know, basically one, 120. So whether we use school choice funds to pay for that or we use rural aid, because our rural aid numbers are projected to be up. So it won't have to come from budget. Yeah. So, yeah, questions on that? So we're still kind of putting the project together to bring back to you in October. It will be a um, I guess hopefully a more full project at that point in the sense of well, no, with the engineering and how we're going to take with the town warrant, put it into the other project. It was there's a lot of discussion of how they have to separate it because it's a grant. You got to show the spending on it. Um, probably should I show you in that original meeting. Shelly thinks it's pretty easy based on some of the other grants we've worked on. Um, other folks on the call thought it was going to be more difficult to put the two together. She doesn't think so. So she'll be in the next meeting. I don't think the account and town accountant will think so either. It's no. just a matter of an account. So, so we'll work it out. Yeah. So we, I just was my, one of my questions is like what gets voted on and how we need I mean, so it's even though it's grant money, we it will sort of like be, it will come up as like a line item. So we have to vote on or we'll come up with capital improvement town, thing. Oh, town approved it last. Spring, oh, okay. so we we covered that. Okay. So, so yeah, eighty five thousand. The yep. town agreed in last spring's warrant. Yep. And so, in just to take a step back, I was listening. Maybe I don't remember. So what happened was we have to fix that front. Mm -hmm. And so, um, truth be told, I didn't think we'd get the MVP done. So I said we have to move forward with at least being able to repave the front entrance, and right. maybe we'll try to figure out how to make it a little bit nicer than just pavement and so forth. Select board told us to put the brakes on and hold for the MVP grant if we can. So we did. We got the MVP grant. Now we got to take the money I got kind of as the emergency fix, put it with the MVP grant, and now we'll be able to make it a you know, beautiful kind of educational front entrance. But we still have to work on how we're going to make just asphalt better looking than just asphalt. Uh, right. Okay. Right. All right. And so okay. maybe the engineers can help us with that. And you know, maybe we do stamping close to the building and it just turns the asphalt out. Mm -hmm. um, but it, you know, the new plantings and rain gardens will be um, will be nice. Yeah. Uh, so, with the first off, congratulations on getting that grant. Mm. Um, the, we uh, have to graduate. Oh, I mean, Chris Curtis did all the work on it. Yeah. So, well, I'm <laughs> yeah. glad we. And if you guys, it's your. Yeah, yeah. No, really there you go. Us too. Um, but anyway, glad we got the grant. Yeah. yeah. Um, 152 k is what the grant. That's what the grant is, right? That's how much you. That is Receiving. with that is the total project cost with the grant. I can there's still I probably should make copies of that. So in, I'm just in wondering the eighty five thousand plus it's it's not plus one hundred and fifty two that we have, or is it? Yeah. Okay. And then the that eighty five thousand is not in that number. Right. It's not part of the grant number. Correct. Correct. So it's an addition right. or okay. separate. It's separate. Okay. But it's, you can't use the grant money to do the asphalt work right. or whatever goes out there because yep. that's not part of this. So the grant um, is strictly for green, green rain green gardens. Structure. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. Now that makes yep. And the, the grant is actually I think or something. It, uh, yeah, it includes our matching portion. Yep. Gotcha. That's, so that's where yeah. Yeah. So, Okay, so the asphalt still needs to be done and it can be done 
Right, the ones fifty that part, yep. but the rain gardens, draining, all that stuff gets the volume to the I'm sending you both every I'm sending the full community both documents on that. I wasn't going into that detail tonight, but I probably should have brought them as well. But so more to come. Yep. And the plan for um, execution or construction is next summer. Mm -hmm. These plans don't. In, um, Maybe come back to what you said. Are they for execution? Yes. Yep. You'll see that they but are the engineered happen. plans about how the drainage works and that kind of thing. Um, what we have to get is the plans just show the hard surface. Um, they don't go into how the hard surface is being. You know, we have to come back with the budget of doing that. And it's a small tweak for the engineers in that part of the plan. So then we'll get that tweak. The engineers will come up with the final plan. So I'll give you the whole process. So we'll get that tweak. The engineers will come up with the final plan. I'll come back to you folks with the final plan to approve. There may be add-on options, which means if it comes in lower than the price, we could add and you know, we want to add, you know, more stamping would probably be where we're at. You know, uh, there may be different, you know, different price points or add-on options. And then you will agree to a bottom line number. We then will um, work with FERCOG to put it out to bid in our our window is we want bids to go out is in probably by February because we want to be on the asphalt companies. That's when they do all their bidding so that we can get it done during the month of July. And probably even better the month of August, but you have to do a bigger window because we're going to probably have summer school here. But Tina's not here. We're going to have to explain to her. Everybody's going to have to come in and sign <laughs> so because we'll block off that front or yeah, we'll have to see what we have to do. Maybe have summer school somewhere else. I don't know, they'll be planning around that, depending on how the contracts. But you have to, if you do a tight window, the price goes up. Because right? you have rain, you have those kind of things, and they have other projects that are affected, not just your project that are affected by rain, but if they're six months leading into you has been washed out, all their projects get backed up, and then they, you know, that kind of thing. So, make sense? Um, and Continue on for your superintendent's report, the superintendency agreement updates. So that's been tabled um, because at our last meeting, um, we had more questions. I have met with the attorney since then, but I haven't finalized uh, getting that. I met with him on Tuesday, I met with him virtually um, to go through. Again, we're, we, we got caught up in the um, three fifths or one or four fifths and what's best and can we do um, I can share what we have learned, but can you do um, three fifths, but also a majority vote of all members? And that's what I went to ask the attorney. And the answer is he does not recommend that because you're doing two types of voting. Um, so we have to then come back and make a decision whether it's three fifths or four fifths. Um, um, you know, for this is all renewal or dismissal or discipline of the superintendent. That's the section that we kind of caught up. Um, I don't think of the other questions that were in there. But I have it all. I have to put it into the thing and send out to the community. And then we have to have another quick meeting about what we want to do in this final thing. Oh, you were there. So anything else? Yeah, no, I just, I, my, my perspective is it was like some very thoughtful discussion. Like I didn't, it, it wasn't overthinking. It, yeah, there were some really good points that we appreciate that you took it back and we'll have a third meeting and yeah. hopefully get it done to bring it out to the public. And we talked a lot about that. There's also a lot of like learning about how come we're here where we're at and that kind of and we get we get we get down some rabbit holes on that kind of stuff too. But it's also like it's gotta work when people are not happy with one another. That's you know, it's easy when everybody's agreeing. You don't need the agreement. You need it when there's tension. So you gotta predict like what if a committee doesn't show up in protest? You know what I mean? Like, you know, those kind of things like like we've seen in neighboring towns where they're just our members or you know, that kind of stuff. So um, we're trying to think through some of those things so it does work. Well, I think it also, there's more to come. Like, this is my understanding, it's a sliver of since we're not technically regionalized, 
officially, right? So like we're, we're not at all regionalized. Yeah, we're like hodgepodging <laughs> some things together, but like there's more. Right to a union to agreement, there would be more. Probably. And so to the union agreement, and what we, this group has decided is that we are just going to worry about the superintendent. Yep. Get that passed, and then we'll do addendums to this agree this portion if we want to talk about how negotiations works or how you know that was kind of brought up as well. Like you know, how do you how does the negotiation team work within the, you know all these kind of things that can be done. Um, but we want to. I really, from my perspective, see you have to have this in place because we saw glimpses of it at the last change of the superintendent. That if you don't have a clear voting and you have disagreement. You don't know how to solve it. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm saying it over and over. If you have disagreement with if disciplining me, you can't make a decision. You know, you see, you've seen it in, in neighboring districts. I'm going to be sitting with council, and they're going to tear apart the fact that you don't have a degree. Do you know what I mean? That kind of thing. And so that's why we're trying to put this together. I'm just being blunt about it. That's, well, it's that's just, why I think that's what it is. To get it <laughs> imperfectly right, really. Right. You know, it's the best that we can. I appreciate the work that's been put into it. We we need something in place. We can't have been very risky to not have an agreement in place for so long. Get it as right as we can and then get it in place. Yeah. And I think that being straightforward with what needs to happen is important to get people on you know to make it to, to figure it out. Yep. And for for people that want to come work here in the art district or the day when Darius decides that he's all done, hopefully it doesn't happen, happen. But you know, <laughs> it would be helpful if that were to do ever. That ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At least there's one new shovel here, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. So, anyways, we're tabling that. Um, I put it on the agenda because it's just posted. You're putting the post together the same week we're meeting to talk about it, so I didn't know I didn't get to it done. Then. Cool. All right. Thank you. Oh, no, no, no. I was reading that. Lunch. <laughs> Next up, agenda is the curriculum. So, um, let's see, I was telling the story last year and I'm just picking back up with my fall season. And we are implementing new curriculum in BLA across all four elementary schools. And I'll tell you about that. And then we are doing a soft launch of my application. Also, um, although next year is our official year for the math curriculum, we know what it is, and some teachers are reluctant to um, wade into it uh, gradually this year. Um, so, for English language arts, we, uh, the committee worked last year through research, through visiting schools, through looking at the ratings of different programs, and um, selected the following. We have Double Escape for our University of Spring Home. And that's um, a quick one online three times a year, which, which is like a medical training checkup, it's just to make sure that everything is um, as we thought and that we, nothing changed without the system that was like teacher notice. Um, for our K through two students, um, we're using the program called U Fly, it's an acronym, U acronym, U F L I. Um, from the University of Florida Literacy Institute and um, for our foundational skills and our learning training approach. That's a uh, half an hour a day and it's multi sensory, it's total physical response, it's um, using whiteboards, using magnetic letters, seeing summons, and um, it teaches explicitly and systematically uh, sound letter correspondence. And, and and fundamental awareness and segmenting and blending and it comes with decodable text so students can practice reading texts that are just the letters and sounds that they've learned so far and have that success the texts get increasingly complex the more letters and sounds they know so after the half hour of group um, instruction uh, that i just described there's a the half hour of differentiated instruction and during that time um interventionist kind of the students um without them missing any period and for a programming and um teachers can pull groups to work with kids um, to share a text to do to listen to fluency students can read and do activities on their own there's games like William lead um there's 
different kinds of games where students can practice what they know that's in. And uh, we've got more decodable texts for all of the schools so that students have more texts that they can read. They're coded so that if you only have seven sounds, uh, the teacher can find books, more than one book, more than one page, they have these sounds being used. Um, and we have um, the, the literacy module is um, from Expeditionary Learning Language Arts or EL Language Arts. This is um, a responsive curriculum. So, whereas you buy this fairly direct and explicit, which is what the research says on interview should be, this is um, clear and explicit, but also there's room for teachers to bring their gifts to the classroom and their background knowledge and to also hear what the students are interested in and create projects in response. The texts are um, diverse. Uh, highly rated for complexity at grade level. The curriculum is accessible. That was one of our priorities was having grade level text, but part of the teaching um, methodology includes read alouds and rereading. And so students are building all of those, you need vocabulary and background knowledge um, with grade level text, even if their decoding level isn't at grade level, they are not being held back from reading that grade level text and building to the other schools. And the writing projects are exciting. Um, let's see, the, I was just helping a kindergarten teacher this morning. The, the final project for the first unit, which is about toys and play, they're researching. First, they write and draw and label diagrams of their own favorite toy, but then they research a classmate's favorite toy and why they like it and how they play with it. And they get a description from their classmates so that they can draw it because the description is so detailed. And let's have them sample it, and teachers can help with them to present. To an audience, of, you know, this is in the school building. This is my classmate's favorite toy and why and why it's used. So there's a lot of you know, individual personality this. And in the sixth grade, at the other end, they're reading the lightning piece and they're learning a lot about Greek mythology at the same time that they discover this text. Part of the research is that the more background knowledge you build into learning um, into literacy, the um, the better able kids are to read because when you have background and context, you know, um, you, you're able to hang your hands. So if you're reading something that's a little hard, but you kind of know what it's about, it's easier to make sense of it. Just why I can't read like a medical textbook is because I could sound out the words, but I wouldn't have the context. So they're learning about um, Greek mythology and the final project is um, uh, writing a chapter into the lightning piece by Percy Jackson, um, where you are as a superpower that you want based on, um, I think, a difficulty that you have because the main character has ADHD, and so the superpower is related to the positive side of having ADHD. So you think about yourself and you write a superhero, and you thought you would insert yourself into the story using some kind of the positive side of the thing that's hard for you. So it's a pretty great program, and that's K through six. Um, and everybody's had the well, teachers five days of training in everything. We're well, just at the beginning, and there's obviously a lot to lift this year. But there's teachers have all been trained in administrative doubles, and the teachers teaching the fly have been trained in fly, and teachers teaching the like, all classroom teachers have been kind of found one foundational day on training in the new program. So they're going to support it with continuing training. There's a, a lot of new stuff going on right now. I don't think it'll ever be this hard again for the next five years or <laughs> whatever. All of the teachers deserve major accolades for what they've taken on the, the layers and layers of new material. Do um, you have questions about the LA before I get this? Just curious how their programs do and with all of the extra learning, the learning curves are folks getting into it and said like teachers, I mean. Yeah, I'm hearing a variety of things and I can't really see the big picture yet because um some of the orders are messed up and we're just like fixing one thing at a time. So it's kind of hard to see the big picture. I hear that the teachers and the kids love the books from the book that the selection of text the this program has been a big hit. I hear that it is cumbersome to plan a lesson. There's just so much support material for teachers. That it's hard to find the distilled, like, this is what I need to teach tomorrow. There's just all these rich connections and suggestions of support and extensions, and just a, I think it's a lot to read. Um, 
but I'm having grade level meetings in October, which is when all of the um, first grade teachers in the district come together for three hours and we meet about curriculum. Same with second grade, same with third grade. I'm sure that in six weeks I will have a clearer picture. Mm -hmm. And I'm so excited that when we meet for grade level meetings, everything we're teaching the same thing so that teachers can really collaborate and help each other. Um, previously, schools were doing different things. And so coming together for those meetings, you could tell stories, but you couldn't really put yourself together for the same insights. And this is going to be very nice. So we will all enjoy that. Okay. Um, math, the math selection committee um, elected. Uh, we were using something called the, well, actually, this was my decision, the universal screen for number sets. And so this is our second year of using it. Last year we piloted it for kindergarten through the third grade, and it was a success. So we're expanding it to K through six. Just like the rules, it's a quick interview, um, five minutes, six minutes, and you quickly find out um, if anyone's doing help accessing grade level content. And so you can adjust your teaching right from the beginning of the school year with a kind of insight. And then again in January, we got the end of the year. And um, the K-5 curriculum is Bridges. Um, this curriculum has three parts to it. One part is um, called a number pointer meeting, and that's the part that a significant number of teachers have opted to try this year, even though we knew that it was kind of a lot to try two new programs in one year. This is a math meeting with for workouts and their fluency routines or um, pattern routines. And so uh, it builds community, <laughs> it's accessible to everyone, but it gets deeper and deeper in its files so that it gets all of the math standards over the course of the year. So I think 83% of the teachers in the district are trying that this year. Um, and then there's four pieces of the math. Most people are waiting until next year to take them on. But, um, there are some teachers in every school who are using it this year because they're new to the district and they didn't do something in them. Mm -hmm. um, that program doesn't go into sixth grade. Sixth grade is using illustrative math, which is uh, going to be a smooth transition. It's approach to learning math is similar and um, problem based. So part of the math identities, we've got a um, built in PD for teachers in both programs so that it's about teaching all learners to see themselves as mathematicians and to value multiple ways of being good at math and accessing problems um, that's built into the nature of things. Happy to provide that update. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it like yeah. 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 <laughs> the teachers are really um you know amazing to be doing this. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. teachers. Thank you, teachers. Thank you, teachers. Thank you, teachers. Thank you everyone. Thank you for hearing them. Yeah. Oh, no, it's really exciting to hear so much of it. It's um, it's just so different from the math that I grew up with. You know, that, or even the English. Just how how responsive it is to yeah. the variety. You know, the understanding the variety of ways people. You know, every brain is different and, and yeah. stuff like that. So that's cool. yeah. I, I appreciate the little minutes that you share. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. You know, clearly, you know so much about this. And so I don't understand some of the buzzwords, but when you sh when you share the story, it's like, yeah, yeah. 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 So I, that's very helpful yeah. as an outsider to understand what all that means. Yeah, the decoding. Okay. I figured out. You know what you oh, meant by the yeah, yeah, yeah. just that idea that you can. I mean, I totally could think of that even like when you're learning a language, or and that's essentially what it is for kids is that they're learning yeah. well, their native, you know, or they're learning the language of the school mm -hmm. and not really, um, you know, it's like, oh, I understand, you know, it's like a wheel of fortune or and those are the only letters you can use to spell anything. Yeah. So they learn how to work with them before they get to cute. Anyway, well, I will say that right. parents actually had a lot to do with rather research on how students under the need from researchers because during the pandemic, parents were teaching their kids at home and realizing that their kids couldn't be, they were predicting that to say that the, uh, <laughs> the trend for 20 years was I can swim, I can fly, I can eat. And they weren't actually sounding out the words, they got the rhythm, they could see the picture, and it was 
I had some sort of some questioning uh, five years ago. We this isn't actually seeing it reading. This seems like memorizing, and then the research resurfaced. But it's really old research that it got redone. I'm happy to be responding. Sorry. I've got to scoot out so I can kids to senior meeting. So <laughs> all right, I'm getting well, all age for, groups tonight. So yeah, good to see you again. Yeah. Joint meeting number twenty-seven. Eight. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Next, we have the resolution to protect rural aid to schools. So, um, this is the resolution that was proposed by a group that's working on increasing rural aid to schools, affecting many districts. So, you very much enough. Um, I don't know if both you saw. Jessica did send out an update of your code information. I did print out and see that we didn't see it or can't oh, we can't print it out. Yeah, it's a little bigger. Yeah, um, it's it's the same as the, oh, the initial one. Oh, I don't know. I meant, oh, oh, thank you. Uh, I was thinking, wait, I think it's some, it might be down to my packet. So, showing me everything. But thank you. Um, it's nice to me. I think I just and this may be information that we are we know about, but just in the interest of anyone who might be watching or might sort of be curious about that. So um so this resolution is to support um rural schools bill, which our legislative delegation has been working really hard on. Um and just where it came from in 2019. The um, Student Opportunity Act was passed to address certain educational inequities in funding. And with that bill in 2019, there was some acknowledgement that, like, okay, like we're not quite sure rural schools is like its own thing. And we need to establish a commission to study what exactly is going on with rural schools. And we will, this is the act that we will fund that commission to do a study. So the Rural Schools Commission did the study. And um, some of the things that they found, which are things that we are sort of seeing in real time, and Darius has talked about sort of extensively, it's more expensive just generally to operate a rural school, especially when there's declining enrollment, but you have these buildings, and there's just a unique set of things that we're facing that other communities who are rural don't necessarily see. One of the things that they found was that it's on average almost 23% more expensive for rural schools to operate there. Budgets and part of that, and Darius, if you feel like chiming in, is around personnel costs, the sort of collective bargaining around benefits. We don't have the numbers that some other bigger districts have. Um, and we also have a smaller tax base um, to pay for these things. So it's more expensive. We have a smaller tax base than defining enrollment. Um, and so what the Rural Schools Commission sort of put out was um, this isn't an equity and we need to address it. So we know that, but there's a lot of sort of organizing that needs to happen around um, getting the rural schools bill passed to be up funded for rural schools, keep them as a center of these, and that kids want to stay in their districts, hopefully, and um, come to school here in their communities. So this resolution is to support a bill that hasn't necessarily been passed, but it sort of it shows our support, and I do believe that. Two other school committees and much original have passed a resolution at recent meetings. Um, so the work doesn't stop here, but I think it's a it's a it could be a really nice thing for us to be sort of like show where we sit. I mean, I would, it, it seems to make sense to pass a resolution here at the schools before the bill goes up for being considered, or, or how do you think I then we can show the support for it. But um, what is the timeline on, do you know if um, the timeline is on that bill? Uh, H3, uh, three, five, five. Is I, that going up for a vote? Or I think it's been, it's been waiting. I think it's been in the wings for a while. Um, so I, I, I think until there's enough buzz to show enough support, which can right. take three to five years for these things to happen, um, we need to sort of put the pressure on, and I know part of that might be engaged in other rural school districts, which there is an effort to do that. I think there was um, it sent out some information if individual members felt inclined to sign 
um, as a committee member onto a group letter, which there's about 300 people in collective rural school um, committees who couldn't can sign onto this letter. And so far, there's about 130 that have signed um, across the state. So I think there's there's still some work to do between individually signing a letter, this, continuing to engage our legislative delegation who have been wonderful advocates. But that's, I think that's helpful information for us, but also if someone's just like, randomly like what's a rural school bill and why? Um, I didn't know about any of this until this last year of hearing various talk at length about the challenges there's been, yeah. and which we'll continue to see. The show is also going to help me with some of the things. And also, ruralschoolsma.org is a great resource to find all of that information to get up to date, um, whether that's us or anyone at home interested in it. So, I'm jumping ahead um, in the superintendent's report. Darius has about the increase in rural aid for this year. More so is this is um, this is a really question. How does that funding relate to what we're asking for in the rural schools bill? Is it? I mean, so, like, oh yeah. So we, I'll jump in. So the rural schools, you know, they did a uh, they put a commission together to come up with the rural schools. Uh, this bill that you're talking about, I don't think it's going forward as a bill right now. I don't think it's going to have the power to. And they're starting to break it apart. Um, but this past year, they said that you know, rural schools need about $60 million worth of um, annual um, increase. And this year they gave 15 million. So it was a huge increase, it was seven and a half million increase from what they gave last year to those rural schools. Um, they, right now they're talking about passing, um, another uh, bill is starting to form up and you'll probably start getting information from MASC on it, that when SOA came out, um, Student Opportunity Act, it is your Chapter 70 funding. So it, so they have this act, but it's still, it wasn't like this new money. I mean, it was more money, but it wasn't a new line. It was, they're funding it through how they do Chapter 70. And that's the money that we get for our, our base, um, you know, our base budget account from the state, it's Chapter 70. So schools like ours and like the majority, it's not the majority, but it, it might be the majority of Massachusetts schools, um, are held in this thing called whole permits, okay? Which means, and if you look at the data, um, the, the, the sheet that I sent out from uh, my superintendent's report, I tried to do that on page two, talk about rural schools funding, but I also talk about chapter 70. You can see that Deerfield got $16,860 for increased from the state through chapter seven. So our budget went up, We did a 3.26% of our budget, which is approximately, I don't know the end of it. My brain is too tired for, <laughs> on Sorry. the fly. Right. She didn't give us the exact number, but <laughs> it's, our budget went up. <laughs> I'm, gonna guess our, I'm gonna guess our budget went up close to $100,000 last year, right? And so it's gonna probably be- 166,000. So our budget went up 166,000 and the state gave us 16. 16. That's 10 to 10. So when you when chapter 70 used to pay close to half, then it started dripping to a third. How long in this funding model until we can no longer with the tax base that we have is the only way to do our school. So rural aid is a part of the bigger solution, but some folks don't qualify for rural aid who are also in old harmless area. So they're trying to use other ways and to fill up the gaps. So the state is, it's politics, right? So it's different groups are asking for the money in different ways and they're spreading out the money in different ways. But in the end, you know, um, we're still being underfunded. So um, we did get rural aid of the 105,000. So now we can say, um, you know, that we got a total of 100 and, what about Thank you. You can take Charlie's spot. She's clearly tired. Okay, so so that's a lot. That's a lot better. 
it's a different funding source though they didn't they just chose not to take rural aid and make it part of chapter 70. they love to keep it separate mm -hmm. so if you go to the third page of my superintendent's report i say we also the last quarterly earnings in massachusetts the tax collection is down so next year that's a free indicator that we may be down fiscally i mean massachusetts has a lot of money saved but they're going to be slow to how they dish it out which means like how much rural aid are we going to get next year and so one of the questions that we're going to have this this budget season is what do you want again and it's very similar with some it would Frontier does for transportation. So the state for transportation for a regional school every year picks a percentage in which they're going to reimburse you at. The law originally said that they were going to reimburse you at 100%. And then since then, they've kind of gone up and down on that. And so every year we pick a percentage number, usually conservative, because if you're wrong, you're paying, you're either cutting your budget or you're pulling from whatever reserves you have just to do your operation budget before the school year begins. Very dangerous stuff. So we're going to have to decide $100,000 is a lot of money um, for Deerfield in the sense that it means, again, it's probably, if we went 3% in the 160. So it's probably a percent and a half of our, a percent and a half of our budget. Yeah. It's about 2% of our budget. Um, so it is a significant amount, but, we also, if we will fold it into the budget, the next year we're going to get slammed. And so this is a conversation I had at, at Frontier and lately this week as well, um, and have it in Conway in an hour. But the the other problem is a lot of schools around us used ESSER money, and you're going to see budget season. It's going to be horrific this year, especially I know some of our neighboring districts who are going to have, they're going to have to reduce staffing because they put things on budgets that on one time, accounts like ESSER money, like rural aid, unless they guarantee, and this is what I've said, I know you guys have a broken record here, but I want you to, be able to say it to other people in your elevator speech, unless the state promises they're going to give us a certain percentage of it every year, we're going to have trouble offsetting our budget without taking risk. And I think this year we're going to probably take some risk. I, I, you know, we'll have to see, we'll read the, with the what's coming out of um, Beacon Hill at the time and, you know, those kind of things. But if you you know say we put fifty thousand dollars of rural aid to knock off our budget to help the tax base, which we want to do, and then they come back and they only give us thirty thousand, you're going to find that twenty thousand from somewhere else where you're making reductions. So it's thank you. We're going to use it, and what we do is that's what we start using with school choice. We'll take stuff off of school choice. We use rural aid. We'll put that stuff back in school choice, and that's why our school choice is a little bit healthier than it has been in some years because we've been using this extra money like ESSER and like rural aid and we've been saving choice because they've left the future so unpredictable that we can't properly budget in the way they're funding us. And so, I'm sorry, I said a lot there, but it's, it's, you'll, you'll wrap, the more you talk about it, the more you wrap your head around why it's kind of broken. Well, I think this is this very much in process bill draft um, is trying to address all that yeah. stuff to make it consistent. And also one of the things that I think is very relevant to our district is providing money to do regionalization, mm -hmm. which I don't know all the ins and outs of that, but there's a reason probably why we're not officially regionalized because it costs money. There's sort of different pay grades and different buildings. And so there is a mechanism, at least as it's written now, to support smaller districts to regionalize and eventually save money, even though it sort of costs money to get everyone up to the same level at first. Um, so there's more there's more sort of in there that could be beneficial to our district as well. And, and they have been able to integrate those things. And there's other funding issue in there. Funding streams within that report as well, talking about transportation and specialized transportation, the amount of money we spend on specialized transportation, if, if the hair fall out, um, you know, that kind of thing. And if we could work together, you know, more regionally to do that, and create, you know, um, you know, special education programs that are in our region instead of, you know, we're, we're, you know, Deerfield is driving people to Long Meadow for public for our pay students. It's expensive. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of dollars a day in transportation. So, for, you know, one or two students. So, it's very expensive. Anyway, oh, that's what it is in the show.
just the, the one thing I wanted to say is thank you for being so proactive and thinking ahead and not, you know, and, and not getting us into that hole uh, of yes, thank you. Shelly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shelly. Um, yeah, we'll make sure we're not we're not um promising things we can't mention. Check and balance. We're fortunate that we could have made it. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Yeah. I would like to make a motion to approve the resolution. I writing signing this resolution. Yeah. I, I motion to approve the uh, um the, the Deerfield resolution in support of the rural school of the good. I and motion to approve the resolution. We just say second, naming. Second. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll make the motion to approve the resolution. Yeah. 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 All in favor? All right. Except the elementary playground project hiring engineer. All right. So. Um, I did share this to you visually, so you have that for those who are digital records. Um, this is part of why there's teams here because we're going to have conversations about this. And we will take a little walk in a minute, but I'll, I'll introduce it here. And it is on our agenda that we are going to take a walk. So we are allowed to leave the room and leave the camera. Sorry, folks at home. But looking at the screen, you've all been on the playground. Um, <laughs> the, the, the two playgrounds off. Um, the, the K-4 playground and the pre-K playground are, um, they were redone in, I believe, 2016, not the pre-K, but the uh, K-4 playground was. And as we will go out and look at it, it is no longer really ADA accessible. And it's unfortunate it's not because it's not considered an old playground yet. Um, we have problems with not only the surface that was put down, there wasn't drainage, was not was a volunteer group of parents who did it, so I be thanked them at the time. But apparently, the, the drainage had wiped out the underneath problem, underneath the lane, and you will you'll see the ups and downs. And as you try to get to it, Tina originally, um, you know, came to me um, about wanting to add more ADA accessible devices out there. We do have several students with with limitations um, physically, and trying to make the playground open for all and have devices they can use. Um, rather than right now we have a swing, but it does require assistance just to do access okay. it. Um, and the other device you can kind of use, but you want to do some, and we've been doing playgrounds in the district where we've seen these in use, which, you know, if you go up to Conway, they have a boat, a, a full chair can get on, anybody can get on, the boat rocks, and you, you can, they play their, whatever their imaginary game they're doing on it and that kind of stuff. Those kind of, you know, which want to start with just one. And then we started talking about then you got to do this, the surfacing in that kind of thing. So um, the idea is, and I put a little picture on the second page, but is to remove, it's a shot from the sky, you can see the blue things is the current large structure. Um, and the um, that light green is the pour and play. Oh, yours is dark. Oh, you know what? I can probably share Did you this. Get it? Circle the next. Oh, wait, yes, yeah, there's digital. Yeah, let me I'll put it on the screen. In the packet, though. Uh, I, can, I can make things happen, <clears throat> I think. There you go. Here we are. It's not great, but better. All right, so. This is this blue thing right here is the current large structure. This yeah. is uh, uh oh actually here. I was trying to don't mind me. I was trying to move my mouse up on that screen. This is where you come out to the playground. This right here is the preschool playground, which we also want to do in phase two to do that one over. Um but coming out here, um, and what you see in the light green here is the pour and play. It's an artificial rubber surface. Looks great from the sky, but we'll go out and look at it so you can get a real idea of what the problem is. 
the idea is we want to put in multiple um, new structures that there are also new structures that we put in recent playgrounds that not just one or two students can use but i mean looking over at Lork, she's been up at conway to see it in action but they have structures that 15 kids can play on once at different levels and different games and different kind of things and so um basically do pour and play from here over to the asphalt and put in multiple new structures based on what we can afford and then keeping the upper side um still wood chipped under the older older but still in very good condition um, multi thing this would allow multiple stations there right now also when you go out and look at it um the chips from both playgrounds it's like you know this is a river in between the, the hard the pour and play again that rubber surface is between two areas of chips mm -hmm. so they cross back and forth and now you can't run a you can't run a wheelchair down with all those chips you can keep them on one side it becomes a little bit more manageable yeah. ideally would we do the whole thing in pour and play sure but we're trying i'm trying to approach this with a and we'll and we'll talk to the engineers about this but um anyway so that's what we want to do first in the second project we want to go to i'm not going into as much detail but basically the, the playground above it which is the preschool playground most of the um uh, play structures are dated some of them can be refurbished they could use some new life to them um they also um you know we got to put wood chips in every year like i just said it costs five thousand dollars a year in wood chips while it is still cheaper to do the wood chip option it's not as safe if they, they get in everything kids get splinters and stuff and other kind of things um but it is to do a pour and play surface in the preschool playground the other question is within it do we reduce the size of the playground we'll go out and look at it there's a lot of different ideas do you do part of it because pour and play is very expensive um you know it does average I don't want to be right. You know, I don't want to be the wrong number. Um, but I, it, it, you know, it's, it's you know, it's a very expensive per square foot, and so you reduce your square footage and, and that kind of thing. But so, what I'm asking for tonight is to give us approval to um, contract with an engineer. We most likely will go with um, uh, uh, Berkshire Design. They're the ones we used for Sunderland and with Conway. Their playgrounds are the kind of their specialty, and um, Basically, they put together a scope, how far you want to go, and then what those budgets are based on that scope. And they can have a lot of add-ons and drop-offs about, so we can start talking about, this is what you're, the square footage you're going to get with pour and play. These are the average cost of structures you're talking about, that kind of thing. Um, the larger picture on this is, how are we going to pay for this? My suggestion is that we look at CPA again. Um, and we go to them and here is my rationale and um and let them know early last year we kind of went a little bit late with uh the tennis courts and it was miscommunication to myself and the select board about who was handling that and they were kind of upset with us that we came in late with it but this is the only playground in town you know we were going to put a park in that kind of fell through so you know i don't know if some of that money could, is, is back on, on use um you know, and so when we get the numbers and that kind of thing, looking at CPA funding to offset that so we don't have to go for a warrant. Um, you know, you come here on the weekend, there's people on that playground all day long. Um, and there are obviously kids on our own all day long. So that's the idea of where to go to it. We may have to chip in some, but we have to get the numbers first. Then when we get the numbers, we start to build how we do a budget. But um, I hinted the thing to Trevor because I already got into his ear about it because I was asking about he was involved with um and so are some other people who are, are on these committees were involved with the redoing of the uh of the, the parent volunteer portion of this of the in you know wanted to kind of him to start talking about like what can the town afford what's the best way for us to approach this and should we be looking at cpa and so just trying to get different people talking about it because it's a project we don't care i don't think how it gets paid for we want the project to get done in the town has different you know different modes and so that's um i don't know the size of these playgrounds compared to conway or sunderland sunderland's was only the early childhood playground that was done correct is that similar to the size here 
Yes. And they did a partial foreign claim. Okay. That's similar to the size of the K that we'll play our map. But I don't know. I'd have to pace it out. It's a bit different. It's probably about the, they're both about the same size. Yeah. I see Sunderland is a little smaller. Oh, wait, the one in front of them. The one in front. Yeah, the one in front is just a little smaller. Okay. I'm a okay for um, let me try to so let me stop sharing here. But in other towns, was there a was there an engaging of like CPAC or PTAs or sort of like kids themselves around? So Conway uh, was primarily funded by the town. So the town had some. Uh, like revolving accounts that they needed to consolidate and spend. So they used some of those funds, but the majority of Conway's playground was paid for uh, with CPA money. And there was a big um, push up there to make it uh, ADA compliant because they actually have a staff person who is in a wheelchair and needed to access the playground as well, not just students. Um, Sunderland had been did a lot of work to fund this. Their project ended up being more than they anticipated, but the majority of it was also from CPA funds. And then I believe that they got an ADA grant as well, a smaller oh, yeah. grant from ADA. And then there were various things like he uh, was able to secure some community donations of monetary donations, as well as in kind with some local businesses. And then PTO made a donation. There was an early childhood playground donation that families contributed to. So a lot of small pieces helped finish out the project. But both Conway and Sunderland, the majority was CPA. So the general, just these are throw against the wall, just we can start just for conversation base. But Michael sent me numbers on pre K areas, 4,800 square feet at $15 a square feet is $72,000. The large playground is 7,700 square feet. The $15 a square foot is $115,000. Um, and then the swing set south, that's another area we weren't sure if we we're going to include this. I didn't include it in part of my presentation. It's 2,600 square feet at $39,000. So, you know, it's a, that's 160 if we did those two groups together. Um, he said, he did follow up another email. Conway's project was $15 a square foot. Um, if we are doing a lot of sub base, it's going to be about $20 a square foot. So it's going to go up by another 25%. I think both Conway and Sunderland spent a total around $300,000 between the quarantine place, the equipment, change orders, signage, benches. But to not make people listening who you know, the teaching staff aren't going to freak out. But the, if anybody else watches it later on, the largest structure out there is in perfect shape. So we don't need to replace that. And so, in, you know, like I said, it's on our agenda to take a walk out there. We probably should do the majority of our business and then walk out there. Well. But with that said, some of the ADA equipment, like it could cost 30000 just for one piece well, of the equipment. So well, maybe that's being, it's again, that's when we start looking for grants and that kind of stuff at the same time. I definitely think it's a conversation to have with CPA. Mm -hmm. It's exactly the kind of thing that they fund recreational use for the community. Trevor went to their meeting on Tuesday, I believe. Could be wrong on this, don't hold me to it, but I believe he said he went to the meeting to let them know we're talking about that this might be coming and so on and so forth. So just really heads up because we did give them really heads up last year and we have a little bit of a relationship. So you're looking for approval to go ahead, the engineers now, what kind of like Probably twenty thousand um, dollars. In range from twenty to thirty. I disagree with Shelly. Shelly said she's always conservative. I think it's going to be around twenty thousand, but she said twenty to thirty. It'll be twenty-five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think we're looking at any less than twenty thousand. And I do think, you know, I, while I talk about us being conservative with school choice, I think that this is a good use of school choice money mm -hmm. and given our balance currently. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to hurt us to spend the money. It, this has come up every time I ask Tina, end of year funds, what do you want to buy? Oh, I really want this equipment so that our playground is accessible. And it doesn't make sense to piecemeal it. It makes sense to do it right from the get-go, not just for that purpose, but for safety reasons. The yeah. wood chips get 
washed away, the kids are on the swings, they kick them out. It's, it's a safety concern as well. And then on weekends, liability, like, how does that, how does it work for the states? Is that a thing? No, I think as long as, yeah, I mean, after school hours, it's, I mean, I've talked to the insurance company about what the actual language is, but, you know, we don't lock off sure. any of it's our just, grounds. So yes, to speak. So yeah, as long as I mean, it, we're probably liable if you remove the slide and it tries to go down it. You know what I mean? Like you know that kind of thing. Like you have to keep it at the um, at what is you know probably some standard of safety. Well, that's good. You answered the question. Yeah, I think we can pay for engineer service. That's the first step. We can't do anything else. Also yeah, understand. The, also understand the, that the is the, that's the here. full block of engineering. So that is right. someone who will come up with a scope of service, come up with the plans, take it with us to bid. They we usually use FERCOG because it's actually cheaper than them taking it to bid. This is again because we've done this a few times, and then see us through the project. Okay. Through the you know, and and Berkshire Design has done a very good job of being on site the projects and making sure that if there's anything complicated going on, they you know. So for the use of the engineer throughout. All right. And, and so, yes, what, yeah, so what I think what my recommendation to chair is to um, finish our new our business, and then because we're talking about it as we go out there, you have to keep the meeting open. Folks who are watching can whatever you know. I'll shut it off so we're not watching nothing. Then we will only come back to adjourn. Not doing any more business into it. Does that make sense? So finish your finish the finish the agenda, and then we're going to take a walking tour. Of someone about sure the way we're talking about. The so we'll vault before the walk. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do all your business before, unless you guys need to see it before to vote it. I don't think I think you've all seen it. Simple. Okay, so then I'll be looking for a motion to approval of the to hire an engineer for the elementary program. I would also recommend when you do real builds like this that you put, we don't want you to, but it's best practice to say not to exceed $30,000. If you want to put limits on kind of yeah, training you for, yeah, I don't know where, I don't believe it, but, but I'm training you for like, you know, if I'm back here, you want to put, if you want, you want to put limits on, when you're bored, you want to put limits on where we are, so, so not to exceed a certain amount, almost everything you do, that way you, we have to come back to you, it should something go wrong. Right. So any, are you, your motion, like, modify With it? With 30, yeah, modify it. So it's the 30,000. All righty. All in favor? Okay. Yeah, I'm sure again. Uh, so the next item on our agenda is the uh, a placeholder for goal setting for the committee. Only that we need to um, read. Um, we were reading the book with some of us, and we needed to. We're, we're still in the process of that. Um, and get them together to discuss it. But um, so far, it's a very good read. Thank you for that suggestion. Um, and, uh, so the equity audit that's happening at yeah. the end of the month is like, I think, a perfect mm -hmm. regroup around our responsibilities. Will be yeah. yeah, yeah, I think we'll have a lot of tie in. Things 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 I will say there is a Some of Us podcast, if you haven't seen that. Oh, um, it, it's an extension of the book. It's not oh, the book cool. itself, but it talks about different extension of it. So if you're a podcast person, right. well, it kind of pulls a lot of the same themes. So. Yeah. All right. Stuff reports. I'm chair of the report. Cooperative. As well. So we talked highlighted most things on it. Um and we just started talking about the um the audit meeting on uh, the 28th at six. And just really I'm, I'm encouraging people to bring questions if 
Uh, so Jim Farrell is the one, was one of the auditors that was here. He'll be on site. You know, he's going to meet with the administration earlier in the day, and then teachers in the afternoon, um, and then you folks at night. But really, if he comes, presents, and there's not questions, I mean, we, I want to say we invested a lot of money in this. So I want people to bring, like, I don't understand why you made this assumption or this connection or these kind of things. Um, I've had some conversations with some members on the side and just really, and if you have like complex questions, if you want to send it to me in advance and saying, I'm going to ask you this question, you, you know, that's also a, a nice thing to do to a presenter because they can, yeah, you know, be yeah. prepared to do that. But it is, if we don't talk about it, we don't bring the document to life before we go to send it to you. So, and it's a big document to be, have some, there's plenty, you know, I'm working through it because at first I was defensive of the school. And then someone came in, like, and so and then someone came in and like was kind of went after the document. Then I was defensive of the document. And before I was defensive of the school. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's like you, you really do have to kind of work through it. And it is about bettering the school. And it's about understanding what the document says so that we can use it to better the school. So as you kind of go back through and um, kind of look through things, please don't chop things down and bring that because if we can have it, it's the only thing on the agenda besides reorganization of the, of the 38 um, group there. So just, you know, if he just presents, it'll be 30 minutes, we'll get up and we'll leave. Yeah, so. And then lots of so that was the other thing. And then, um, let me say pretty much for all. Oh, the only other thing is the, um, I said the other night as well, is there will be some meetings coming up because uh, my contract does expire at the end of this fiscal year. And my contract says that you have to make a decision on me by January, by the end of January. So that requires, one, we don't have this group agreement in place yet. Our hope is to put something in place so that we can use it. So kind of a trial run through, hopefully in a non-stressful point, for my sake. <laughs> um, but there will probably be joint meetings in um, either October, November to decide, A, to negotiate, my, to say yes to negotiation. Then you got to make a negotiation subgroup. You got to negotiate my contract. And then you, you got to come back together to vote and negotiate. So there's business to be done in the next few months, and that's why I just put on my report, just let people know. I haven't looked at the superintendent's review, but doesn't it lay out, specifies who is on the negotiation committee? Okay, so the best. It's chairs. Right. Or their so, designee. At least we don't have to do too long. Make you say. Oh, no, no, <laughs> chairs are not on the negotiation. The chairs appoint the negotiation person. Okay. So okay. the negotiation committee is not the agreement. the agreement committee. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> we'll get through it. We'll get through it. Now explain it all. Yeah, I just wanted to put on people's. Right. I just want to put people on people's radars because there's more meetings and I don't want it to be a surprise all of a sudden. Like, oh, I forgot it was a, a contract. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so now for our walking floor. Yeah. So what I would say is that we will come back to adjourn. We are not going to do that on video because we're not going to keep this open for 20 minutes. Okay. But there'll be no, you just make a statement, there'll be no business other than adjournment. Okay. We do that when we go to executive session. We're going to come back to adjust to adjourn the meeting. Okay. So at this point, we are going to uh, go for a tour of the facilities. And when we return, it will, there'll be no business because we're to adjourn. We're turning off the video. Okay.